this teaching was originally recorded at the Embracing the Sacred Feminine Retreat held annually at Menla in Phoenicia, New York. To learn more about this annual program, please visit menla.us. Sorry, I just asked everyone to say your name, but let's go ahead and do it again. Sarah. Lily. Nancy. Nancy. Julia. Justin. Mary. Bo. Justin. Cindy. Nana. Victoria. <laughs> Alexandra. Star. Rowan. Christine. Stephanie. Ava. Oh, Bob. I see that's okay, someone gave me a marvelous chocolate macaroon that I was saving for a special moment. And I went to get it and I found it. I put it in my uh, chicken. No, it's a pine cone. No, it's a pine cone. It's a pine I put it in my I put it in my little blue case, and I was all excited after lunch to come get it, and it wasn't there. And I looked around, and it was in the middle of the room. So, Nasi got it. So, so same Nasi that ate my acorn. I brought an acorn from one of the oldest oaks in Scotland that I had had on my altar for like five years. And I put it here the last time I was here on my altar, and I came in in the morning, and there was no people. <laughs> and Massey was there. <laughs> so don't put your treats, because they will be eaten by Massey's or doggies. <laughs> so anyway, so um, I'm going to, uh, what I thought I would do, since we have new people joining us, is uh, go over where we've been so far. And of course, what we're studying here is the power of the Great Mother, and in particular, the generative power that she brings uh, to us and exemplifies for us. And we began the class by, by looking at the different goddesses as they're expressed in the different cultures. And then we also <clears throat> looked at the fact that, of course, one of the things that is true is that there's not a culture around that does not have this study of the generative creativity of the goddess as part of the cultural setting. So um, we looked at that, and then what we did was we um, looked at the concept of the mystery schools, which have preserved uh, some of the more ancient understandings of the goddess uh, pre-5 BC, uh, which were preserved in the mystery schools that came through Sumeria, Egypt, Greece, and into the uh, just uh, around fourth century AD, and when they went very much underground at that point. Um, and what we're doing here in this class is we are learning how to kind of rekindle the connection with the Great Mother and sort of bring forward this knowledge again through our own experiential knowing and, um, and through the encounter with our own creativity. So what we've done so far, and for those of you that have just joined in the class, you can go ahead and do this same process by uh, downloading a meditation that's on the sacredstream.org website, which is called Finding Your Spirit Guide. And what we did in that meditation is we connected with the Great Mother in the form that she takes that has the meaning for each of us that is strongest. And then um, we uh, set ourselves onto a path of initiation with her um, because, of course, all mystery schools have uh, a, a series of initiations for the people entering into the study of the knowledge that's held in that mystery school. And the purpose of the initiation is to help you clear any obstacles that might keep you from being able to hold the power 
of the knowledge that you're about to receive effectively. So that was another meditation that we did, and I can, if you want me to, I can, I recorded that meditation, if you want to do that meditation. And um, then we spent time, of course, uh, finding the place in this beautiful place where we feel the presence of the Great Mother most strongly, and we spent time there um, asking more information about the uh, processes that are needed for us to clear any further obstacles in order to be able to hold the knowledge that we started working with um, this morning. And then, of course, Bob gave us this beautiful lecture on the Tara and uh, the Green Tara, which is the personification of the Great Mother, one of the personifications of the Great Mother in the Buddhist tradition. And we were given this beautiful picture of her here. And uh, we learned um, her mantra and how to evoke her and call her. And um, then we also spent some time this morning looking at the nature of the creative portal. And uh, this is uh, something that is easy to perceive in the process of birthing. Kind of hard to mistake that portal opening up and the unseen moving into the scene, right? And uh, we looked at the requirements of the portal in general and the way in which creative power moves through a creative portal. And then we also identified the creative portals within ourselves and uh, looked at the way uh, that energy moves through it or doesn't move through it, the condition of the portals, our relationship to these portals in our lives. And um, we spent some time here this afternoon looking further into what needs to be done, to what changes might need to be made in our lives, or what new structures might need to be put in place in order to be able to um, bring forward our creativity and to cultivate the different creative portals in our lives in as clear and consistent and unobstructed way as possible. And of course, I think many people uh, had were able to see how, how this material is relevant to them in their lives. And one of the interesting themes for me, I was reflecting at lunch, I was reflecting on one of the interesting themes that seemed to come forward uh, in our inquiry was the fact that many of you actually had a good understanding about the nature of the creativity and the nature of your creative product. And you understood that you needed to protect it in some way. And uh, I, I think it's very interesting that so many of you had this understanding and had put in place structures that were designed to protect the creative product but were actually turning out to block you from your creativity. Mm. And then the task is, of course, to be able to generate new structures, new containers, to be able to access, not only protect the creativity in a more effective way, but then to be able to express it uh, more fully and directly in your life. And another common, you know, of course, one of the common uh, themes that we saw as people were beginning to look at what it might mean to actually truly express this creative power that moves through them and which unites them in the dance with the Great Mother, with her great creative generativity, is a, a fear. You know, a, a, there are different types of fear, but what, what does it mean to enter into that kind of a dance? What kind of a, what, what do I have to, what do I have to face within myself that uh, might become an obstruction to my ability to dance that dance with the Great Mother? And of course, this is what we were working on further this afternoon. And so this whole class is in itself a process of initiation. And when we're looking at the nature of initiation, how initiation is tied with change, 
how it how it shall it, it it creates one form as another form is breaking down. Old forms have to die in order for new forms to be born. And the way that the initiation works is by challenging the status quo, by challenging what is, and then allowing for the processes of transformation to release the power that is held in the old form so that it can be dedicated to the new form. And this is a very important part of creativity, and that is actually the dance that we're working with all the time. And one of the things that I did not say, and I just want to point out since we've already been through all of these processes together, is that you know we have this concept of the destructive goddess, or um, you know that's often personified by someone like Kali, um, and then we have the personifications of the generative goddesses. And I just wanted to point out that it's important to see that the destruction that needs to happen in the old forms is imperative. It's actually part of the creative process so that the creative forms can take uh, the power that is in those outworn forms and dedicate it to something new. And that is actually what we are in the process of doing here in this class. We're changing the way that we have been. We are changing our relationship to our creativity and the portals that hold it. And we are bringing forward a new way of being and dedicating the power that is released as those old forms fall away to the new way of being and the new forms and the new relationship to creativity and thereby stepping into a larger participation with the Great Mother, becoming truly one of her, uh, uh, the word that comes to me is handmaidens, um, but that's not meant in any kind of uh, pejorative or less than context. It's actually a, you know, a, a great honor to be able to dance that dance with the Great Mother and to dedicate ourselves to those creative processes that she mediates and demonstrates for us. So that's pretty much where we've been in a, in a general way, for those of you that are just joining us. And, um, you know, we, we talked at length about the creative portal. And Bob, I don't know if you've ever heard of that expression before, the creative portal. Sure. Well, then I don't know what you mean by it. Maybe not in that particular way. <coughs> um, but one of the things that I just wanted, with your permission, to kind of explore with you is who you are <laughs> as a being in terms of your own creative portals. The, and the creative portals being these, if you look at your life and you see all of the different things that you have created, all of the books that you've translated, all of the students that you've taught, Menla, Tibet House. You know, if you, if you look, I don't know. I mean, you are such it's a, a kind creative. of misery, I know. But you're such a creative being, you know. There and I think that if if you look, you know, I remember we were talking when you were in San Francisco, and you were you were feeling a little discouraged, and you you were saying, you know, the Tibetan people are not free yet, but. You know, if you look at everything that you have accomplished, all of the different forms, Menla itself as a creative portal, and all of the creativity that moves through here, Tibet House as a creative portal, and all of the creativity and all of the teaching that happens through Tibet House, and the way in which Tibet House is one of the many creative portals that the Tibetan diaspora had to create as they had this huge creative portal of Mahayana Buddhism that they had created a safe container for within the Tibetan culture, as they had that destroyed. And, and you can look at the way in which the Tibetan people <coughs> and the, at the direction of His Holiness were so dedicated, they had so much intelligence that they needed to create new creative portals to hold the power of the Mahayana practices as practiced in Tibet. 
And they, one of the first things they did was to establish the monasteries and to establish these centers for learning in order to be able to hold this creative power that is the essence of Mahayana Buddhism. And if you look at Mahayana Buddhism itself, it is a tremendously powerful and creative portal that holds teachings that are dynamic and which are, they actually the difference between Mahayana Buddhism and Hinayana Buddhism from my point of view is that, and again, you'll have to correct me, Bob, if I'm you know, incorrect here, but, uh, Hinayana, of course, is a wonderful holder of the Buddha's first set of realizations, but it didn't allow itself to move with, this, with the Gandhan re Renaissance. It didn't allow itself to be able to take advantage of this tremendous amount of creative power that came through Tsongkhapa and that came through Asanga as they were working with Manjushri and Maitreya, respectively, um, channeling this powerful information that became a renaissance and became a deepening of the wisdom that was available to human beings on this planet. And so if you, if you just, I just wanted to spend a moment to just look, you know, have a look at all of these creative portals that are around us. The, the Mahayana Buddhism itself, the the universities that hold and maintain creative portals for that powerful creative force. Uh, the way that Tibet House takes its place in, in maintaining containers for that force here in the United States. The way that Menla takes that one step further. And if you look behind Menla and Tibet House, of course you find Bob and all, his, all of his creativity, all of the translations that he's done, to make so much of this knowledge available to us. And he has offered this transformation. If we talk about, you know, the, you know, the process of translation is the process of transformation. And you can see the goddess working through Bob wherever he is appearing. And he appears everywhere all the time. <laughs> and I mean, I, you know, I, I, I guess I'm singing praises. <laughs> Well, I think we have to say that, that uh, Nina is the creative portal of Mela and Tibet House. In a sense, we are a team, you know, and I kind of have a voice about it. And I have, I, 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 I react a lot, you know, I blah, blah. And, but she actually organizes and structures and is, it creates. Without her, none of this much would have happened. Yes, uh, yes, all, all and, honor uh, and kudos to you, Nina. She's overwhelmed by it even right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but that's very kind of you to say all this. But what, what is occurring in my mind, do you, you want me to do something yes, now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's very, very sweet of you and kind of you. And uh, it is a tiresome thing. I'm, you know, I'm known as a horrible workaholic. Actually, Nina calls me a Buddha hawk. <laughs> And uh, it is kind of the, my nature. And, uh, but in a way, the, the whole concept of creative and generative, I, I wanted to say something about that. Because the nirvana itself is called the uncreated. When Buddha attained uh, bliss, you know, freedom from suffering, nirvana, under the Bodhi tree, uh, you know, like 2,700 years ago, when it was, he said, profound peace, something uh, luminous, clear light, total free of elaboration or proliferation, and then do much uncreated, like an elixir of immortality is the reality I have discovered. And then he, his whole thing went on from there. And uh, because, you know, the, the idea of divinity that people have, and it, it does still harken back in different cultures to the idea of creation, you know, that somebody created the world. Whereas from Buddha's point of view, the world as inhabited by self-centered and ignorant beings. Ignorant described as those who think they are the center of the universe. 
and others are you know, subordinate to them, which others don't agree to <laughs> ever, and therefore it's a strife. You know, because each one of all the individuals thinks they are the thing. And therefore, <coughs> nobody agrees with anybody when, unless it's kind of sort of superficial, when everything is, everyone is, when the plates are all full, then it's like, oh, after you, you know, after you. But when, when there's a famine, as uh, one friend of mine used to say, it's everybody suffering for himself. <laughs> <laughs> or a fire or something like that, except for the exceptional being. So, so the so creativity, the creativity of the Buddha, the creativity that actually I think true secret of all creativity, including the, the Great Mother, comes from we have to decouple it from the idea of creating the world, just any old way kind of thing. And in fact, what it is is creating freedom and creating a better world and creating a freedom from suffering for others. And, and that creation comes from beings recognizing it's somehow the uncreated and the selfless and the, the unborn. And there's like it said, in the first stage of that realization, it says something called the tolerance of birthlessness. For example, then the thing of portal is interesting to me, the Vimalakiti Sutra, I keep forgetting to bring that. In the Vimalaya Sutra, there's a very famous thing, the ninth chapter in my translation, where Vimalakirti invites 32 bodhisattvas, who are all incredibly wise sages, to express what they call the Dharma door. And here the word Dharma means reality. You know, the uncreated reality that is the reality of freedom from suffering, which is what we all are in, actually. Actually, really. We think we're in some place, like we're in the barn at Menla, at the, in the class, and then we're going to go somewhere else and go to dinner, go home, and whatever. That's what we think. But actually, in all of that, we're in nirvana. Actually, we're in total freedom. And uh, so the Dharma door, so that, that's the reality. But then that reality becomes a door. Because, in a way, freedom itself is a negation. You know, we think, you know, people, even, even W was going to fight for freedom. But he wasn't thinking that freedom is simply, it's a negation. You say salt free, sugar free, trouble free. Mm -hmm. And after 2008, oh, W free. <laughs> it's a negation. And so there, in a way, that's why people are afraid of freedom. The, the one guy who lived in Woodstock, actually, the famous Eric Fromm, we studied a lot about Nazis and things as well as many other things. I bet he knew the guy actually in the old days. And uh, he wrote a wonderful <coughs> book called Fear of Freedom. And, uh, yeah, the Escape Freedom from Fear. What? Freedom from Fear? No, no, no Fear of Freedom. freedom. Yeah, that people, you know, you know, the authoritarian personalities <laughs> who wants to be subordinate to something and be brought around and feel secure under some walls is afraid of freedom. It's a, it's a very, you know, the Frankfurt School, I mean, it's a big deal. It's a big thing. So, but, so the kind of creativity, so, so for example, talk about a thing of beauty. What is beauty? What, what, what is it that we like when we say something is beautiful? Well, isn't it something that lifts us out of our habitual way of being? In other words, we're drawn to it because it seems to be, it seems to lift us out of the intolerable situation of being ourselves with, against the world. And maybe when we're young or when we're very satisfied for temporarily or something or under some kind of relief, we think that's, oh wow, I'm not against the world, oh, I love the world's great. But actually then we get sick and we grow old and we die and people don't do what we want and they do what we don't want. And we, we have a lot of problems. And ultimately, the larger game of it is that as long as we're in that self and other situation, and we're unfree, and we're driven by an anxious, you know, insecure, frightened, and therefore greedy and aggressive, and confused and depressed self. 
Okay. However, and, and freedom from that, so beauty lifts us out of that temporarily. When people say, people use words like rapture, which actually, if you think of it, it's not such a nice word, <laughs> rapture, but, or being transported, or being elevated, lifted up. And so, so beauty is in a way realizing the uncreated goodness that is there when we're free of the situation of self-centeredness is actually what beauty actually is. And what is ethics, therefore goodness? Goodness is when, you know, we're, we, we do something helpful to another, we don't, we're not harmful to them, or they're not harmful to us. And precisely that means when they are relieved that at least that part of the universe is not coming after them. So they're relieved from this <coughs> difficult self and other confrontational situation. And, uh, and luckily, both of those things coincide, which was Buddha's discovery, which is actually, let's not forget that Buddha, Buddha's great successors, actually, Buddha was a little earlier, but Buddha's great successors were simultaneous with Socrates, with the Deuteronomy of Isaiah in Babylon, with uh, Confucius and Lao Tzu in China, with many Upanishadic sages in India, Zoroaster was around the same time as Buddha in Persia, and many other people whose names we never heard. Uh, and so there was a vibration in the planet of the discovery of the goodness of the world, actually. That's why all the lawgivers in all of the civilizational streams that are now most present on the planet, even though people haven't been following their laws, mostly, but still, there were about 2,500 years ago, know what is called the Axial Age. So I don't want to get into too much into history, but I'm just saying that Creative creativity, therefore, true creativity, has to come from the heart, and in a way arises from the the channel of that creativity surrendering to to the force of the goodness of the universe, like that, rather than something one makes up and fabricates out of some idea that this enhances me or this will get me favor from others or or whatever. You know, this is something you know like these people like Warhol, this is something I can sell, like a Brillo box. So, so now, therefore the great mother in Buddhism, as we said, you know, yesterday, is the Prajna Paramita. Is every, and Prajna Paramita is not a person outside somewhere. Prajna means, Nya means to know, like the English, did you ever wonder why in English, when you know something, you're actually knowing it? <laughs> now, what does it mean if you did pronounce that know? What would it be? The K-N thing is something that happens in the glottis. You know, it's like in the back of the upper part of the mouth. So it's kind of like, it's a little bit of a control thing. You know? A little bit like a sneeze, you know it. So it's like a... It's uh, by itself, knowing in that way is not really that useful. It's just sort of labeling something to control it. But pra, it goes before the pranya, means super, super knowing. And super knowing is a knowing where you have become the thing that you're knowing. So you're not in a way controlling it. You're in a way giving yourself over to it. And by giving yourself over to it, it, you become completely empathetic with it, and you know, and you completely know it in an almost bodily, in an enveloping, enfolding, actually female way. Mm -hmm. And then paramita means to go beyond, transcend. And what that means is you transcend the subject-object, you know, negotiating way of knowing of the of the poor self facing the much faster world and seeking to sort of dominate it or be protected it, and are all these fruitless things that ultimately will not succeed. They can only temporarily succeed. So, so, so the creativity, like Basho, the famous Japanese haiku poet, he said, it was Zen, Zen, but also haiku poet, he said, if you want to express the tree, you have to become the, the pine tree, I think, actually. You have to become the pine tree. Meaning you have to give yourself to the pine tree 
and then the voice of the pine tree in you, between you, comes up something that opens a doorway for another person to feel the gift of the pine tree. But if you just sit back, oh, I'm going to now do something great about that pine tree, then forget about it. It's going to be boring. Okay? So she, but, but she is a, a mother, yes, she, what does she generate? She generates all the Buddhas. And then in your summary to the newer people here, you didn't get into that, and I don't blame you, because you get, well, we all get lost in that. But I felt, you know, I feel that in, in this special woman's focus, meeting, class, my contribution was to kind of try to indicate why, from the point of view of Buddhist psychology and biology, in the Buddhist sciences, the female human form is superior to the male human form. And I'm not saying that just to get brownie points, although I don't mind if it results in a few. <laughs> I'm very happy that it does. But I'm saying it's because of the factuality of it. Which, because if enlightenment is not defined as people unfortunately try to define, here I'm repeating myself to you who've been here, but enlightenment is not defined as some awareness of some blazing light or vast space of light somewhere else, like heaven or trans heavenly space, uh, as opposed to this place of sunlight and dark that's filled with all problems, and therefore sort of an escape from everything. That is not the Mahayana definition of enlightenment, which is Buddha's real definition of enlightenment. Enlightenment is expanding your sense of identification which the human being has special ability to do, where the human, among animals, has a particular ability to identify with another through love. Mother and child, you know, mother and embryo, then mother and child outside for a while, <laughs> till teenage time, or, uh, at, at the latest. Uh, lovers, you know, until honeymoons are over, uh, etc. you know, teams, etc. Be, human beings can expand their sense of identification and the preposterous claim of the Buddhist science is <coughs> that the ultimate evolutionary form of life is a form of life that embraces by identifying with all life, all living beings. They say that a Buddha perceives every living being, including every cockroach and even the mouse who you so kindly gave your chocolate to, or whatever it was, and your acorn. You pestly brought that acorn from far away from that mouth. Although I think probably it was all dried out, but that mouth was very disappointed. <laughs> and and uh, uh, even that mouse, one perceives as a mother perceives one's only beloved child, or the mosquito that bit me and gave me malaria three or four months ago, or whatever it is. You know, when you think that, it's overwhelming, of course, to think what that might be. How, what kind of consciousness could that be? And it's even beyond an individual body. Like each ordinary person, they live within the envelope of a single body. And, but a Buddha does not. A Buddha is in everybody, is everywhere. And uh, every building, body, planet, continent, whatever it may be, they feel it's all their body. And it goes it way beyond the idea of having, although there are experiences, powerful, what mystical people call mystical experiences, where one has an experience of everything totally disappearing, except there being kind of just a vast luminous space. And one feels one is that luminous space, and one feels that all other beings are that luminous space. But the strange thing about it is all of them and oneself have all disappeared. So then it's easy to feel one is all of them, because there's nobody around. So here we're all one, and none of us are here. And so many people mistakenly think that's enlightenment. And it is an important step toward it. But the true enlightenment is non-dual. And it's after that experience, which is not that easy to attain, but it's attainable, that then that experience becomes fused with, becomes one with the experience of all the differentiated beings. And yet, one still feels one with them, if you follow me. That's much more difficult. That's where compassion gets engaged. Because the only way you can possibly have that ability to identify that way, feel you are the mother of all beings, is you have to be a hormonal ocean. An ocean of a positive, an ocean of oxytocin. But it could be defined as you become an ocean of oxytocin. 
And that notion of oxytocin means you perceive all the beings in it as pure bliss. They're just bubbles of bliss, every single one. Jazz deep. Well, Jazz deep is a bubble of bliss, even on ordinary level. With that hairdo and that headband, and aren't and the name. I'm sorry, I shouldn't do this. <laughs> and but you perceive every being that way. And then, what do you encounter? If you truly empathize with them all, you encounter their own misunderstanding of their own situation, where they feel not so well. Mm. They feel discontented. <laughs> they feel angry and annoyed, or frightened, or or crazed, or whatever it may be, or 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 mad. You know. And then, since you feel all that, and you realize that you that that's how they feel. You realize it in a non-dual way, completely, and yet you simultaneously realize that they are nothing but bliss, including, but they're shaping that bliss into a feeling of misery. That's your compassion. You simultaneously see the bliss that they are, and you feel the misery they feel that they are, and then all you are is a vast art form. Your oxytocin ocean takes the form of creativity, to manifest whatsoever it takes to get them to open their awareness away from the feeling of enclosed in an envelope of misery to where they embrace their own bliss. Right? So, but that's a, that's a creativity that wants to liberate, not to proliferate, is what I'm saying. So therefore, it's a different creativity than the one assumed in cultures where they think the archetype is a god creating something willy-nilly filled with suffering. You know, which of course the theistic traditions, creative theistic traditions, can never get out of that one, which is why they insist on blind faith. Because if, if there's an omnipotent being made everything and still on total on top of it all and it's filled with death and suffering and misery and the loss of children before parents and all of the worst things there are in the world, then what, what kind of weirdo is that? <laughs> As I think Shelley said, like some terrific demon to create such a veil of suffering. But the point is the Buddhists, so Buddhists are not against love though. Brahma, who was the creator in the Indian ordinary culture, you know, the Buddha and other and various Buddhist yogis met Brahma and, and Brahma said, well, you know, don't blame me. I didn't create it all. People think I did because I was a, a big shot and I'm a really powerful being. But I didn't create it. And then, please, Buddha, you, I don't even understand it for me. He said, I'm not sure how it all works. He said, you, Buddha, I, at least I'm smart, I'm clairvoyant. I know you're going to understand it. When you do, please tell beings when horrible things happen to them, it's not my fault. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can for them. But, you know, they, it, we're all mutual. It's our mutual ignorances and our mutual sense of we are against it all and it's against us that causes all the suffering. So please tell them that we have mutual responsibility. <clears throat> oh, I hope you're not... Are you okay? I have to go back to work. Oh, you have to work? But it's perfect. It's yeah, it's okay. okay. <laughs> 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 it's great to hear. <laughs> So, oh, so I, hope, I think we're recording it, I hope. So I, I'm I supposed to record. I never record it. Okay, okay. I got it. I got it. Okay, so, so, so that was my, so therefore if that's the case and that's enlightenment, is the motherhood expanding? Never mind what I looks like a male, because he doesn't look that much by, like a male. By the way, if you ever want to check out any guru who's claiming to be a Buddha, perfect Buddha, just check out under the underwear. Seriously, one of the 32 marks of a Buddha is that the penis is in sheet like a stallion. It doesn't hang out. <laughs> it's over, but that's a fact in the tradition. I mean, I didn't ever notice anything like that, but that's a fact in the tradition. So, in a way, it doesn't really look that male in normal thing. It's always, you can tell in India, the statue of the Mahavira of the Jain, who is very well hung. <laughs> and the statue of the Buddha, where it doesn't, you know, that fold there doesn't look like it. <coughs> which doesn't mean it doesn't have one, but it means it's drawn in a, in a sheet-like structure, they say. So that's a sign. 
So any guru, you know, give them the, as one of the guru tests you can know, do. It doesn't mean there can't be gurus and teachers, of course, as long as they don't pretend to be the ultimate themselves. So, so, uh, so my point is that if that's what enlightenment is, actually, rather than escaping from all of this in some blinding, sort of fabulous, like self-congratulatory, self-satisfying situation, it is a very self-satisfying situation, but it's one that, like a mother, is in the same moment embracing all beings who are not yet necessarily, as far as they are concerned, in a satisfying situation. Actually, from Buddhist point of view, they are, which is why you can embrace them. Because he has a double vision, where he sees their real reality, and then he sees their artificial ignorance-based reality, driven reality. And, but then he's committed to, as a mother, is committed to save her child from suffering, to protect it from suffering. Uh, he, she, it, the Buddha is not always a he, is committed to bring, it, bring those beings into their awareness of their own bliss. No, not a bliss that Buddha gives them, not at all. They have it themselves. They just have to open to find it in themselves. Okay? So if that is a biological fact, as the Buddhist sciences say, then the biological reality is that the female form of the human being is superior to the male form. And therefore, in our era, in our time, of after 5,000 years of chauvinist, militaristic, violent, brute domination by males, which doesn't even make them happy, but and has very, very carnage, very seas of blood flow, then the women must step up and really take charge. At least or at least balance. And, and maybe that will be new since there we also discussed one thing that that uh, that Isa in her excellent summary didn't mention was we also discussed this uh, this archaeology of, and discovery through literature and archaeology, but more archaeology because it was pre-text at least that we have, that there were many, many you know, millennia, uh, decades of millennia of female-dominated civilizations, matriarchal civilizations throughout Eurasia, before the last five, ten thousand years, when the, the guys with their G.I. Joe kind of took over starting with chariot warriors coming out of Central Asia, the first like Mongolian type wars, came out of Central Asia to Europe and India and China and Persia and even all the way to Egypt and so on. So, so is that, that was my point. That's a great point. <laughs> and uh, today, since I'm supposed to contribute something, you know, in the, in the afternoon session to help He's uh, lifting, doing the heavy, was doing the main heavy lifting in this class. What I thought I might do is move a little bit into another thing we did, with a little touch on with uh, people who were here before, is we experimented with this concept of selflessness and emptiness, and which is the, is the nature of ultimate reality from the point of view of Buddhist. Uh, science. And especially the first point there to be made is that the emptiness is not nothingness. It is something between somethingness and nothingness. And actually what it is is the condition of the somethingness. Because luckily there is no nothingness. <clears throat> That's precisely what nothingness means is it's not there. <laughs> and that's a really important thing for everyone to know. There is a the first part of the past, as taught by Tsongkhapa, taught by Atisha, taught by Manjushri, taught by Shakyamuni Buddha, is for human beings to realize the preciousness of their human embodiment. How precious you are is because you become a human being. Now, the material scientists. Carl Sagan had a beautiful thing back in his Cosmos series, which some of you older people might have seen along with me in the 70s. And he had this thing where he would walk on the cosmic calendar, you know, from Precambrian slime, a few hundred thousand or a billion, half a billion years ago or something, whatever, on the planet. And he would walk down the days to like midnight or 11.30 p.m., where suddenly human beings come up around 100,000 years ago according to that theory, you know. And then finally there's the, there's Carl Sagan, actually. 
<laughs> Professor at Cornell, tenure. And, and uh, you know, the highest achievement. And, uh, and but he's the highest achievement because who has been coming all that long way? Some genes. And actually, according to the English guy from Oxford, selfish genes. <laughs> Not even selfless or compassionate genes, selfish genes. Just trying to get more like Pac-Man. It's the march of Pac-Man. <laughs> Pac-Man has finally created a human being to consume more things, so it fits very well with consumer society. So we could, we have, we're, we're composed of billions of Pac-Man, you know, the microbiome consuming things, and so we need, therefore, we need a Tesla. We need a BMW. <laughs> but it, so, but he would still talk about how miraculous the human being is. You know, the joints of the arm and the fingers and the brain and the going on. So he has an appreciation. The material scientists have a great appreciation of that. But where they fall short of the Buddhist science is that you, we personally were not involved in that amazing evolution. And not only were we not involved in that whole long, incredible past, but we're not even involved now because we have no soul, we have no real mind. It's an illusion of the brain. It stops the minute we die. So essentially, we're already nothing. Spiritually speaking, we're nothing, right? That's a key, cardinal point of material science, that we're all nothing. We're just waiting to realize it by dying. We sort of have previews by sleeping. <laughs> when we have deep enough sleep, good enough sleeping pill, no dreams, right? So, so therefore, that worldview doesn't make us very precious as individual persons. We're just, we're maybe, you know, yeah, we're someone who depends on us, our child, well, we're precious to the child, they, have, they need us to grow up. We're precious to our parents because we're their child. Maybe we're precious to our government because we pay taxes. <laughs> we're pretty, you know, but, but we're, they, they have an expression of materials. I think it's 85 cents of cap, cheap chemicals in a bag of water. That's what we're worth. And, we're, and our presence and existence is an accident and we, we change by random mutation, there's no causal process, we, sort of, we can't control it. And then if we went to school and we studied Darwin, Marx, and Freud, we are completely convinced at the end of that that we have no free will and we're 100% helpless. And that guy Daniel Kahneman at Stanford just got a big prize for proving that you can't even make a choice. You, wonderful, made a beautiful thing yesterday about freedom means choice ability and responsibility and ability to take, make choices. But according to them, your brain already made a choice two minutes before you knew about it. <coughs> and so they're proving to you that you're a helpless biological robot. All of them. They're completely insane, actually. I'm sorry. <laughs> but our, because why? Why am I saying that our scientific community is insane? Because they all have consciousnesses. They all have spirits themselves. That's what's making their mathematics and reading their machine dials and looking for the Higgs boson and worrying about dark matter and dark energy, which I think they're scared they think it's the great mother. Should it come in the dark? <laughs> and they're uh, defending their 3% of bright matter. <laughs> and that's why they were screaming all over the papers worldwide that they have a Higgs boson, which I call the Higgs boson. <laughs> But then they were qualifying at the end of each article. Well, but there's 97 percent dark energy and dark matter. We haven't yet seen it because it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's just cuckoo. <laughs> and they are running the planet into the toilet. That's why we're having spring in, 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 in winter. And but they, you know, and they, they even think they, they simultaneously tell us it's terribly dangerous, and they tell us it's all over. We couldn't change it if we want. So they're naturally the politicians and the oil set of telling people and coal people don't pay attention to that. But I'm sorry, that's a digression. Mainly, my point is, then on the other side, the theistic people, you're precious because you have a spark of that precious creator who there's no really good reason for you to believe in because of the existence of evil. Is that precious, actually? So it's not that, it's also a little difficult, that belief, but it's a bit, it's much better than the nothingness belief. And, and that preciousness is never to be experienced by you until after you die, and then again, you have a salvation that you can go, if you've been good, and you've 
you've gone to church or whatever, belong to the mega church or whatever, or synagogue or mosque or temple, Hindu temple or whatever it might be, you then get to go and sing in the choir for eternity. So instead of all of that, why are you precious? You are precious because you personally have a beginningless life. Your own life is infinite. You have been in every conceivable life form there were in the past. Every, really, much more horrible ones than the human one. Also more divine ones than the human one. Demonic ones, even. And you've been Brahmas, you created worlds. And then, but now, somehow you have come to this adjustment. Some, some intelligence of yours has risen. And you have chosen to be human by having chosen ethical reactions and actions in previous lives. And ethical means actions and reactions that take into consideration the beings you're interacting with. The animal with suffering and life is called, in Buddhist science, the suffering of one eating another. You know, just immediate consumption. It's like the Pac-Man world. You live in fear of being consumed by a lion or a tiger, you're a deer, and then you're consuming, actually deers are nice, they're just eating grass. <coughs> Maybe they pick up a few ants with their tongue, but they mainly eating grass. But some animals both eat and be eaten. And that's, that's really, and their, their evolution is such. But then when you were an animal, when I was an animal, don't take it personally, then sometime I was about to pounce on something and eat it. And then some dim thing in my little brain that mainly wants to eat, identified with that thing and saw it was scurrying off to steal her chocolate. <laughs> and it wants to run off somewhere and get a piece of chocolate. And I identified because I like to run off and get a piece of chocolate. So I didn't pounce on it. And then I waited a little while and I got more hungry and pounced on it. But that tiny little increment of feeling what they're identifying with the other thing and then not using it and letting it go is, is ethicality. It's the beginning of ethicality. Not harming it. And, but imagine how many of those have to build up incrementally to get to be human who can actually give its own life to another, or even to get to be a mammal. Then before that, the lesser animals are, they lay eggs, right? The young, you know, I don't even know how they have sex, but I guess when they swim by some place, she drops eggs, and he goes by and sprays around there. Then they all take off, and then it's up to the eggs to manage, right? That's one way. <laughs> That's what they say. So then when you have it inside your body, even mammals like tigers, lions, deer, that's a much bigger commitment to at least one other by the female. And then the human gets where, it's not that humans can have more, you know, triplets or something, it's just that the human, it's much more, you, you know, they can think their way in and out of whatever it is. So, you are precious because you have become a being that has access to freedom. You have freedom from all kinds of hardwiring, and, and, and evolutionary niches, environmental niches, where you can only do one thing. And also you have freedom in this kind of a society where you're free to come to a class on the Great Mother and the sort of Buddhist relation to the Great Mother. And you can change yourself, go through portals of creativity, of tolerating the, the, the letting go of some old structure and opening into a new insight. And that's the, how many people on this planet do that on a Saturday? <laughs> Not so many. And many of the, the, there's mil, hundreds of millions of slaves on this planet right now. Actual slaves. Owned people. We have a lot of women, also boys and things, slaving in factories or groves and things. Hundreds of millions of them. And then people in prisons. And then they are slaves. In our country, we have two, three million people, and they have to work in there, so they're also slaves. They get 35 cents a day in their prison cell. And something like that. They make license plates and the road signs you see on the highway. Um, and uh, you're free, so that you have all these kind of freedoms. And you're also intelligent. You're not, you're not defective in your brain or your mind or something. And you, and you can really, you can do yoga, you can think, you can, you can channel. And, and uh, on the other hand, you're also in a place where there are teachings, there are guides, there are enlightened beings, their presence is there in literature. If you can't find one on the street, you can find a book, you know. And, but there are so many who are there. 
And the men are particularly lucky, since they're a little backward. That's made up for the fact that there are equal number, of more or less, of women to teach them something, if they would be smart enough to learn. Right? Someone once asked me, you know, when I talked about a concept of cool heroism, in other words, the person who reacts to injury and provocation without reactive fury and anger, and you know, even self-destructive blind fury and anger, which is, which is what normal, when fury takes you over, where you have bad judgment, pretty much self-destructive, although it may also harm others in the way. And they said, well, where is any of these cool heroes on this planet? You know, and, and, and it comes to my argument that we all totally believe that anybody can go in, the mil in any military and get brainwashed and conditioned in boot camp to do what they normally wouldn't do as nice people, which is go around and stab people with bayonets and shoot them and machine gun them and do horrible things to them. And they can be trained to be callous, in other words, about others, and also even risk their lives completely to do so. But they're supposed to do only, you know, survival of the self is only what they're supposed to do. But they can be trained not to survive. And therefore they were doubting that people <coughs> as a cool hero can be willing to give their body without harming anybody else, without hating anybody else. In other words, using love rather than hatred to develop an equal self-detachment. They made that argument and then they asked me, asked me, to show what a dumb man I am, I was like feeling really cornered by this argument. Like, where can I find a Gandhi? No, I was thinking like that. <clears throat> and then, of course, I realized, I thought of my own family, both my birth family and my present family, my, where I'm a father. And I realized the males in the families are often locked in violent confrontations. Siblings fight each other. Father and son fight each other all the time. They have, you know, an edible thing tells them they're supposed to, <laughs> actually. And siblings in societies where they don't Fight, they're not fighting bears or wolves or, you know, they don't have to do farm work together and they don't need each other. They're just competing for resources and fighting over the chocolate bar. So they don't necessarily get along well. So then I realized, well, how do families stay together? Well, of course, it's because women are in the families. And the women don't react with immediate counter-violence and immediate re 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 avenging energy instantly when there's conflict. And they're always in the middle taking blows. No, dear, you didn't mean that. No, don't beat each other. No, don't hit him with that club. No. And sometimes getting in the way of getting hit themselves. Occasionally, some of them get rough, you know, like, what was that, Elaine and Bob? And they case. <laughs> but, but, but mostly, they're bearing the brunt and they're cementing, you know, the oxytocin is keeping the cortisol from blowing up every single family on the planet all the time. So there's your cool heroes. Right there. That guy was nailed. <laughs> it was, but it, it was disgusting that I had to figure it out. It took me so long. Having been the beneficiary, having a hot temper throughout my life of, of women who are showing cool heroes. So, so the preciousness you would not waste your time in your life just making money or just achieving this worldly or getting another house or rushing around like this and like that. Instead of, not that those things are, are some degree unnecessary for mo most people, but you wouldn't waste your time putting so much priority on quote unquote survival things if you realize how precious your opportunity, your life moments, and days and weeks and months of waking time and even you're going to learn to use sleep time and dream time if you realize that you are at a moment where you can accelerate your evolution towards vast embodiments of great motherhood of great enlightenment of great blisshood you could in this life form like incrementally like leap, leapfrogging over billions of lifetimes of slogging along, just grabbing what is in front of you. And that is the purpose for realizing how precious, from a scientific point of view, how precious your present intelligence, embodiment, and sensitivity, and creativity is. And, if you, and, and, and all that kind of meditation coming from the Buddhist sciences, appealing from the great mother of wisdom, 
doesn't just mean you sit and sort of just try to condition yourself of, I'm so precious, I'm so precious, I'm so precious, like that great guy who, on the TV who says that I'm worth it and I'm nice, so that thing. That's also okay to do, but think about why you don't think you're precious. Who told you that you have no soul? And what evidence do they have? Who told you that the consequences of how you live end at your death, whether you're good or bad, before it's all over? There's no effect. And it's just an accident anyway. And you're just a robot. But what evidence do they have for that? Which person? Well, I always like to say, did Carl Sagan report back saying, hey guys, it's cool, don't worry, I am nothing. <laughs> There's no future experience and consequence to how I live. Do good or bad. So don't sweat too much. Man. Take a break. Drive your BMW, whatever. Even if the whole planet goes down, everybody will be nothing. They won't miss being on the planet after they've gone. They'll be anesthetized, eternal. What evidence will there, not only what evidence is it, they always tell me. I say, I have a friend who's a movie maker. He contemplated making, made, making a biography of me on the film. And, you know, fiction life. But anyway, he had a scene in the end where I was at Columbia and Lowe Library. Or it could be Widener Library at Harvard, anyway, a big room like that. And I was on trial from the natural scientists <laughs> and the social scientists and the, all the humanists who grovel to them all the time. And I was on trial for sort of misleading the young into thinking they might have a future life and a former life. <laughs> and I was being, being forced to recant. He thought that would be a concluding scene. He thought that would be cool. Yeah, it looked dramatic That's sense. So I got it like But then, because they always ask you, what's your evidence? There is no evidence for future life, former life. And then you say to them, well, there is a lot of evidence. Many people remember previous lives. There's huge literature of documentation of people remembering previous lives. And continuity is the rule in nature. And you, have, you guys have the law of thermodynamics. And mind is consciousness and soul have energy. So they are energies. And you have a doctrine that no energies can be destroyed. I grant you if people say mind has no energy, then that's conceding to you. But that's not what we say. Mind has a very, just a very subtle energy, but it has energy. Of course it does. It changes, moves, it lives. It's alive. Your spirit and your mind and your soul is alive. It's infinitely alive. So there's a lot of evidence, and there's a lot of reasons. And then, and then you say to them, what is your evidence that you could have some energetic process become nothing? Uniquely the, the spirit of a living being. All others you have forward dynamics, no energy is ever destroyed in the universe. So it's, it's ridiculous, it's even incoherent to say a stream of anything becomes nothing. It just changes form. And they can never say that. But they, they try to just make a dogmatic assertion that mind in particular never did exist. And therefore they give you the salvation. You know, the scientists are high priests. They're big bang, you know, and all their crap. They're a bunch of high priests. And they're telling you, they know what's going to happen to you, so rely on them. And they give you salvation in that you don't have to pay for consequences of anything negative you ever did. And there's no, no reason to really strive to do anything positive that hard. You don't have to run, run after burn and do a political revolution and create a miracle and get rid of the oligarchs and the morons who presently have usurped our democratic government and are not serving, not doing their job and not serving the people. But we just nothing we can do about it. We're all powerless because we're just biological robots. <coughs> so that, so then, so that makes second point. So first point, you females are the superior half of the human species, and you're getting a raw deal worldwide. Actually, you may think if you're in California or New York, <laughs> you're kind of doing okay. But actually, you, the Equal Rights Amendment was never ratified in this Neanderthal country. And <coughs> the rest of the world is really tough. And mm -hmm. there I recommend, I told Alexander about it, a book by Marilyn Waring, and those who are making notes, sociologist from New Zealand, called, W-A-R-I-N-G, called Counting for Nothing, called the, the Labor of Women. 
and she means labor in both senses. That labor bringing life to birth to beings and, and gestating them and bringing them to birth and then labor actually in the, in the, in the country. So, so that's, so point one is you are the better half of the species. So you have that, you have, you can take pride in that and assert the power of that. And you also have the responsibility of that. And you can't just hide. You should, you know, it won't help you. Point one. Point two, the human species as a whole, even the guys, is an immense, immensely precious life form. And each individual who has one has labored enormously in the infinite previous lives. And every male has been female. And every female has been male in previous lives. And this life, therefore, should be educational in the deepest evolutionary sense. That's what human life is for, to expand toward Buddha life, toward enlightened life, which doesn't have anything to do with religion. It doesn't mean being a Buddhist. It means becoming, expanding that empathy and sensitivity to the infinite degree. And then, third point is, and for that I brought today, the flower ornament scripture, as or sutra, which it doesn't really mean, it means discourse, but of course this is your text form, so it's a scripture of a discourse, of many discourses of the Buddha. And that discourse goes into creativity, actually. Closer to what, you know, the idea of creating a world would be. But what it is, it's recreating a world of suffering into a world of bliss. Both being relative worlds, though. The world of bliss is not an absolute world. The world of suffering is already an absolute world. And it isn't really suffering. That's what, the absolutely speaking, it's a blissful world. No, no, don't leave. No, <laughs> come back. <laughs> I know why you're going out. Just. My friend, my dear friend, please stay. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, In the Chinese commentary on this school based on this sutra, which the Chinese are called the Huayan Shu, or Huayan Jiao, the school of the flower ornament, or the garland. And the garland is a garland of universes, actually. It's what is meant by the garland. Flower, universe, flowers of universes. And there are said to be three levels of this. And the first is the level of seeing true voidness. And so the Dharma door of non-duality, the Dharma door of selflessness, the Dharma door of, of emptiness is where you overcome your fear of death by letting go of yourself meditatively, which is the deepest way. Actually, when you give a gift with true generosity, which is something you truly care for, which you actually want, but then you let go of to give to someone else, in spite of the fact that you want it, and then you don't also think about, oh, gee whiz, I'm so great I gave a gift. Like Lisa gave her acorn to the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I mean to you. Anyway, when you do that, that's like you die a little bit, you know, that you're letting go of something precious to you. So that's like a kind of, Mini, mini death, anytime you let go of anything. You let, when you let go of, a, of an impulse that you have to do something, you know, uh, angry or greedy or something, you let go of that, that's, you're letting go of some habitual structure. It, it, you're, you're, you're letting it, you're destroying it a little bit, you're, hep, you're restraining it. That's also realizing emptiness, actually. When you feel like reacting to injury with fury and anger and counter injury, and you refrain, you restrain your anger. That's a little bit of a death, you know, a little bit of a, a little bit of a destroying the old pattern. And all you, through which those are all doors of, those are the portals of creativity, as I understand, which is what I think I'm talking about, as a side by you. And, and, but the most deep way is you, you critically analyze your body and mind and self, seeking that self 
that, that we habitually think is the real thing that's in here, the fixed identity, the real me. And, and when you fail to find that and sustain that failure to find, you find lots of relational processes, of course, which in a way constitute yourself as a flow being, as a relational being. But you don't find a fixed thing that's your real you, you know, that holds on to your social security number, your barcode, your, your fixed identity. You don't find anything. <coughs> Everything, including your name, is just relative. You actually are, you do exist as a relative process. You don't exist as a fixated thing. And when you realize that viscerally, that sense of being that fixated thing has to let go of itself. You kind of let go of holding on to the, that illusion. Your ignorance makes you hold on to that illusion and you let go of it. And that's the portal to the new you, which is, which you know never is fixed. So therefore you have to constantly be nurturing it. You constantly create it. You constantly make it beautiful. You constantly make it do beautiful. You constantly make it good. You constantly make it do good. You constantly make it real and true and integrity. And you do integrity and real and good and true. And that's always a work in progress. Because the beautiful is always beautiful to someone in a context. The good is good to someone in a context. The true is something true in a context. It's never some absolute fixated thing. So you become a living work of art. You yourself. Right? So the first step in the Chinese version of the, of the flower ornament school is seeing true voidness or selflessness or emptiness, whatever you want to call it. The negational freedom from all fixated, non, non-relative structure or non-relative core that we assume things to have and we assume ourselves to have. That's seeing true voidness. And that's where you, by following that deeply, you will reach an experience if you become an adept meditator and you truly use your critical analytic, not blind faith, not just believing that's so, critically analyzing what makes it seem to you that it's not so, is how you get there. And when you do that, you will have that experience of everything, including yourself, disappearing. One of the thresholds being a kind of frightening feeling that you're going to get lost somewhere, or you're going to become nothing, or everything will become nothing, which you control by realizing that nothing is nothing, Eureka. <laughs> so that you can't be in it. But you, it will, everything does disappear. It's a vast, luminous, very releasing state past the letting go, which is a little bit frightening. Then, once you reach that second step in this YN, is where you realize that that disappeared state is the only, is the reality of it, but that is not destructive of the appeared state. And then the appeared state re reappears like the reflections, uh, reflection in a mirror. For it's like the analogy being when you discover that the mirror is a blank surface of shiny matter, and it has no scene in it that you see when you look in your rear view mirror or in your mirror and see your face or something. There is no other you in there. There's no face in there. It's only a reflection on this blank surface. So, and therefore the reflection is simultaneously the surface. Although it's blank itself of the, of the image that's reflected, it also does reflect the image. And now all of the differentiated things that you see there are like reflections. You follow me? But yet it's so deep and inconceivable at the visceral level that, the, that no analogy really matches it. You follow that? So the second one is the non-duality of the absolute and relative, which means that that the absolute emptiness is the relativity. That this is, that nirvana is this relative, conventional, samsaric world. And it's only samsaric, meaning bearing suffering, for those who don't know that it is also the absolute. And who think that each little thing in it is an absolute, conflicting against the other absolute. Because of ignorance. And then the third level. And so that level... <coughs> is kind of cementing the portal with the place of being. So that the whole place of being becomes a portal. Something like that. And by knowing that, the mother, the mother sensitivity, the mother compassion, the mother wisdom, 
has no realizes there's no escape from all the relational and there's no escape all the beings and you know we're all here we're not over it this is not over at six o'clock it's not even six o'clock it's not over then we leave we never leave we're here together forever we even we die we'll be reborn with each other again and again we have already been met each other again and again how why do we come here how come we're here well we've already been doing many things with each other infinite times in the past and now we're here again and we'll continue to be in the future so then the mother knowing that and if we really know what this is all of us we will realize this is fine it's not a problem we don't need to escape from this this is bliss we're all each other's mothers we're all the mothers of each other we're all here to create happiness for each other. We all love each other. That's the best way to be when we're forced to be together in torture. <laughs> There's no escape from it. So how can we be having conflict? Conflict only comes from thinking, I'm going to get rid of this one. I want that one out of my life. I, you know, we, we, the two of us and I can't coexist in the same time. 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 So then the third one, though, so then the mother wants to spread over everything. The great female, the great mother, present power. Then the third plane of this, which is what the sutra really expands, is called the magnificent activities path. You could call it the magnificent creativity path, for sure. Because this creativity is not to proliferate new worlds just for the heck of it, disregarding its impact on others. It is creativity drawn by love of others, made by love of others, which therefore is drawn by others' need for happiness and need for freedom from suffering. Compassion being the way you hook up to another, to another's need for freedom from suffering, that's called your compassion. And your, ha and your love means hooking up with others' need for happiness. So they're like two, they're part of a circuit. So therefore you can't have real compassion, actually, unless you have some happiness to share. Because well, if you're miserable, how would you, and you think that's the natural way of things, how would you think that another who's miserable could be anything other than that? You wouldn't really feel that intuitively. Only when you have some bliss, and you realize you see the other pinched one, like, uh, and then, then you see they don't need to be pinched up like that. And then, then you, you have compassion. You say, you don't need that bliss. And you see, you feel, you can, just like we always see others, you know, when we're paranoid, we think everybody else is afraid of everything. When we're happy, we see everyone else smiling. You know, we notice some, whatever they feel good about. So then this is called, not the non-duality of, of absolute and relative but the non-duality of relative and relative. Sure, sure, why? If anybody knows Chinese. Are you Chinese or Japanese? Korean? I'm Mongolian. Is your girl, right? Oh, Mongolian. She's from Mongolia. Oh! Mongolia, Kella! To know. I'm from Siberia, actually. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I like Mongolia. I'm half Mongolian. My spiritual father and grandfather were Mongolian, Kalmyks and Buryatia. Um, yes. You're Buryatia? Uh, half. What? Half Buryatia and half Mongolian. Oh, thank you. Buryatia means Siberia. Uh. Very cold in winter. <laughs> so, okay, I'm sorry. So the, the, it means the non-obstruction, non-duality, neutral non-obstruction, non-duality of thing and thing, of relativity and relativity. And so what that means is, based on the knowledge of the absolute being relative, that the relative and relative are mutually intertransformable, and therefore magic and miracle are possible. Magic and miracle are possible. And to benefit others then, if you go deeper and deeper into that, then there's nothing you can't do to benefit another. Freedom from impulse, from craving, <laughs> I can never 
So, so, so this sutra is 1,500 pages in, in uh, translation from Sanskrit into Chinese, and then from Chinese into uh, English by my friend. And there are different versions, both in Sanskrit and Chinese. Uh, and they, within the sutra, there are many sutras. But I just wanted to, there's no, you, you can't describe it, it's called the inconceivable liberation. In a way, you can't really describe it, but you just have to, you just have to sort of let it resonate in the imagination. So what I thought I would do now at this point is have you meditate and not listen to me with with sort of reasoning mind, which I hopefully you were doing till now. But meditate with your imagination and your visualization. <coughs> but and don't, you can't probably very actively rush out and paint a picture of this extraordinary types of, of uh, description. So you just sort of let yourself float in it, okay? But be in a meditative mind. So thus did I hear at one time, which is all sutras, which are records of Buddha's discourses, are, uh, that's a sort of sort of certificate of authenticity, that someone actually heard this. It was there when Buddha said it. And it's, but this is introductory, saying where Buddha was and what Buddha is. The Buddha was in the land of Magadha, somewhere in India near uh, where uh, anyway, in the middle of India, an important kingdom at that time, in a state of purity, at the site of enlightenment. Actually, at the Bodhi, he's under the tree of enlightenment, actually. He's under a tree, like a shaman, sitting under the tree of enlightenment, having just realized true awareness. The ground was solid and firm, made of diamond, adorned with exquisite jewel discs and myriad precious flowers with pure, clear crystals. The ocean of characteristics of the various colors appeared over an infinite extent. There were banners of precious stones, constantly emitting shining light and producing beautiful sounds. Nets of myriad gems and garlands of exquisitely scented flowers hung all around. The finest jewels appeared spontaneously raining inexhaustible quantities of gems and beautiful flowers all over the earth. There were rows of jeweled trees, their branches and foliage lustrous and luxurious. By the Buddha's spiritual power, he caused all the adornments of this enlightenment site to be reflected therein. This is creativity. The tree of enlightenment was tall and outstanding. Its trunk was diamond. Its main boughs were sapphire. Its branches and twigs were of various precious elements. The leaves spreading in all directions provided shade like clouds. The precious blossoms were of various colors. The branching twigs spread out their shadows. Also the fruits were jewels, edible jewels, containing a blazing radiance. They were together with the flowers in great array. The entire circumference of the tree emanated light. Within the light there rained precious stones. And within each gem there were enlightening beings, like angelic bodhisattvas, in great hosts like clouds simultaneously appeared. Micro, body, micro angels, micro bodhisattvas. Also by virtue of the awesome spiritual power of the Buddha, the tree of enlightenment constantly gave forth sublime sound speaking various truths without end. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit them online at tibethouse.com. Dot U.S.